Hi, everybody. How is the energy? It's the last session of the day. Well done. You guys have like stayed the course. Um, big thumbs up. So my name is Natasha. I'm a operator. I'm a brand builder. I'm a storyteller at heart. I'm also a fitness fanatic, former jazz singer. And for the last six years, I've been part of the team at Seed Camp. European seed fund investors in a couple of the founders you may well have heard from today. So the likes of Julian at WeFox and Nick at Revolut and lots of other incredible businesses. And today I'm here to talk to you about the magical dark arts of branding. And the title kind of sums it up. What the fuck is a brand? Literally, like, what is it? And I just gave you, as I came in, like a few little cues about some of my brand elements, if you like, that I like certain things. But they don't tell the whole story, and they're things that have evolved over time. Because your brand and your business evolves over time. So how do we take all of the different elements that contribute to what it is to be a brand, and carefully and with intention think about those? to make something that can really go the distance and have some serious longevity. Now, there's a reason that you no doubt recognize the symbol of this company, and that this little cheeky mascot maybe makes you feel a bit warm and fuzzy, and that for some reason, even though if we're quite honest, the technical spec of this product is not the superior one, you still really want it because you covet it. You really desire it. Or why you can take something and build an iconic shape around it. But you can have two things that are, are really pretty much exactly the same. Some people might argue that one tastes better. But there's a reason you really want this one and not that one, as this video which is magically going to appear on the screen, is hopefully going to show you all. If there's some volume, please, for the video. Mm. It's a really funny video, which maybe I can be the comedian and narrate through if we don't get sound. OK, so essentially what's happening here is this guy is going to the fridge, and he's asked his friend for a Coca-Cola. And his friend gives him a Pepsi. And he's like, oh, well, screw this. I don't want a Pepsi. I asked you for a Coke. And his friend says, well, it's the same thing. In fact, Pepsi probably tastes better. But he doesn't want the Pepsi. He feels like he really wants the Coca-Cola. And the words he uses are that the Pepsi is second rate and he does not want to be seen to be with the product that is second rate. So you might think you have something that's exactly the same in a market. I'm going to send you all this video, by the way, afterwards, because it is actually very good. But the idea of being second rate or second best, nobody wants to be that brand. And let me tell you, nobody wants to have customers who feel like they're part of something second rate. Why would you ever advocate for something that is second best? Let's see if they can the move board, my slides Well, then why on? not Pepsi? It's second rate. It's a good <laughs> brand. Coke is better because it's Coke. There'll be no more discussions. You're going far beyond saving. <laughs> At least I'm not drinking Pepsi like a flop. Well, I mean, you got a little bit of it. But essentially that. At least I'm not drinking Pepsi. Like, wow, you'd be that willing to reject the one thing just because you don't want to be seen with it? Like, you'd admit you don't even like the taste of it. Now... When it comes to brands as well, we maybe have the, let's say, Marmite. You might love it or hate it. I think this, this character possibly invokes some of those quite extreme feelings. And also with a brand, you'll have language and tone. That means you can do things like take to Twitter to very clearly and succinctly map out your new policy for your employees, because your brand is a brand that cares about giving people the flexibility to live and work from anywhere. And your brand is about that. You say that to people, so you need to live it and breathe it internally. And also a brand 
has a massive impact when it comes to doing some of the hardest things you'll ever have to do, such as layoffs. Now, let's not be blind to the situation we're in in the world right now, where this is happening everywhere. But there is a way to do it that is in keeping with a brand and with a human tone and message. That means that even journalists can look at it and say, OK, layoffs suck. But you know, if you're going to do it, this is how to do it. And there can still amazingly be positive brand sentiment for this company, in spite of them having to do a really difficult thing. And then the counter here is, here you have two layoff emails, leaked emails, from two very large tech companies. Now, you look at them, and they say very much the same thing. And in fact, one of them, when you actually delve into it, is offering a slightly more generous severance package than the other. However, because of the brand sentiment around the one being Stripe and the other being Meta, you can take the Stripe one. Because of the reputation and what they've put into the world over years, you feel more positively about this one than you do the other. And you'll look at little nuances and details, like being more human in the tone, and it will make you feel more positive. Now, why do I give you all of this information? Because really, the kind of lesson number one is that your brand is absolutely everything. And yes, it may have elements of there's the color and the logo and the identity, but your brand is what you put out into the world. And it touches absolutely every part of your organization. And so we have to be intentional about it at the beginning. Now, I know what I've shown you is lots of very large and very well-established brands. And you're going to say, Natasha, that's fine, but <laughs> we're just starting. Like, tell me what to do now. So I'm here also, I hope, to give you some comfort that every single one of these brands has had to start somewhere. And so let's wind it all the way back to the beginning and think about, well, how do we start? And at the start, you really don't need to overcomplicate or overthink things. You need to build a minimal, minimum viable brand that will get you through to the next milestone of the business because you're a startup and everything is about growth and getting to the next stage. And your brand is going to be evolving with you along that. So how do we start? Simply with looking at the four Ps of what it is to build your minimum viable brand. Your purpose, so why it is you exist. Your positioning, where it is you sit in the market. Your profile of the customer you want to go after, your ICP, so who really wants this. And your personality, how are you expressing yourselves and how does that come to life both verbally and visually? And so if we take these four things, it's like, OK, great, these four things. But then how do you start thinking about how to tackle these different areas? So we've got to ask ourselves a load of questions. So for our purpose, well, why is it that we exist? Why is that important? Why do you devote your energies to this? Like, there are many easier things to do than start a company, yeah? So you've made a choice to do something that's really hard, and there's got to be a reason for it. How much are you actually committing that to paper and telling that story to people? Why should others want to tell their friends and colleagues about it? You know, they don't want to tell people about that second-rate Pepsi. And why would investors want to invest in you? What's that story? And, and why would any employee want to work with you? And then how are we positioned? Like, what is it we actually do make or provide? And how can we be really clear about what that is in the here and now? And one of the biggest concerns, and I was actually having this conversation just earlier with a startup founder, is, is how you take people on that journey from what is often a quite big and lofty purpose and vision about the world to the reality of being a very tiny company that's doing a very limited thing in the here and now. And the reality is your, your position will evolve over time, and that's OK. You're moving it towards this North Star big vision, but, but the position does not stay static. So what are the benefits of what it is you're doing in the here and now, and what makes you special? What don't you do? Because as well, one of the biggest mistakes you can make in the early stages is trying to be everything to everybody. You can't. It's impossible. 
So being very clear about what it is you do and don't do, what would happen if you went away, and what it's like to work here. The who, so who really wants this? Who's that disproportionately influential customer? Who are we competing with? And like, actually, who do we want you to associate us with? And then how do we do it? How do we communicate? How do we bring it to life? How do we stand out from the crowd? And how do we want people to feel when they interface with us and our product? Now, this is all great. Lots of theory and stuff on a slide. I thought what I'd do is I'd actually try and bring it to life a little bit to show you how it works for us at Seedcamp and to show you, if you like, the back end and how that informs the front end that you might see. So if we take our purpose, it's that we exist to identify and support exceptional founders solving, using technology to solve some of the biggest problems of tomorrow. Our positioning is all around the idea of Europe, Seed, and being a network-powered fund. Our ideal customer has a strong founder market fit. They're a great storyteller. They compel other people to go on the journey with them because that's obviously integral to hiring a team, raising your next rounds. And they have massive ambition because if you're getting into the game of venture, then obviously you need to be able to communicate that big ambition that people are going to see that massive pathway. And then how does this translate into our personality and our values? Because your personality as a brand should really spin out from the values that are true to you. And if they don't, you'll fall down. Now, for us, they're quite simple. We have sort of three core buckets around being community-led, entrepreneurially-minded, and teamwork-centric. And there are different things that fall out of that. So if we take all of this as the back end, what does this then look like as the front end? So we describe ourselves as Europe's seed fund. We invest early in world-class founders, attacking large global markets and solving real problems using technology. Now, to me, this passes the Ron Seal test. It does what it says on the tin. If you took our back end of our purpose and why we exist and our positioning of what we're trying to do, this feels like a genuine and real reflection of that. And then if you think about some of the activity that we put out, because your, your values are not things to be stuck on a wall and like, yay, guys, we did our brand values. It's like, no, what? actually does it look like when you take those sort of things and start bringing them to life as activity because your values need to drive your behaviors. And so for us, if we're talking about things like being network powered, we talk about the Seed Camp Nation and having this nation of a thousand founders, mentors, amazing experts, and people who've been there in the trenches at the first stages of the all important steps of building companies. And so then an uh, activity for us might look like something like this, which we just launched the other week, which is Seacamp Firsts, which is using the knowledge and the hard-won knowledge gained from people from within the Seedcamp Nation to take you through the various stages of company building. Also, when we break down our values and we talk about things like transparency and openness, it leads us to do things like this, which is share our fundraising deck. And if we believe in those sort of things, if founders have to do that, then it's only right we do similar. But we don't always get it right, because on your journey to building your brand and trying to be authentic and stay really true to who you are, you will fuck up along the way, and that's okay. And there are just like really small minor ones of how we've done that. So if we talk about being very human and open and friendly and found a first, and then you come on our website and we're all like this, and like really stiff and with our arms folded, it's like, oh yeah, shit, that probably is not a very good visual representation of what we're saying. So if I'm telling you something and then I'm showing you something else, you're going to break trust and you're not going to believe me. So now when you go on our website, it looks much more like this because we are a team. We do smile. We don't just fold our arms. And the thing you need to know more than anything is like, this is the Seedcamp brand now. That isn't where it started 14 years ago. And your business and your product do not stay still, and neither should your brand. Now, I think about building a brand a little bit like, and the life cycle of a brand, kind of like the journey of growing up. So you start as a baby, bit of a blank canvas, can't do anything for yourself. You're reliant on standing upon the shoulders of giants to lift you up, and you need to leverage them to help you to do practically everything, because you're right at the beginning. You can't be expected to do it all. You then got that testing toddler phase, trying to find out what your product market fit is, throwing things at the wall, seeing what sticks. 
to that awkward teenage, like, uh oh, I'm a bit like, what we do now? We're gonna like try and, you know, screw things around a little bit or like test some different things, be a bit bolder. You then need to start growing up. You become a bit of an adult. You need to start taking a bit more responsibility. Then a proper grown up. Stuff, shit gets real when you're a proper grown up. And there's a danger when you're reaching this grown up stage that if you don't stay true to your brand and your proposition and what your customers want from you and who you are, that you have a bit of a midlife crisis. And you don't really know what you're about. And people, if you don't know what you're about, how does anybody else? So I thought I would just take you on a little bit of a journey about how some of the brands that are no doubt brands that we all know and love have evolved over time. If anything, just as a reminder that you will evolve over time and do not drive yourselves crazy sweating the small stuff in the beginning because it will and it should change. So, our baby, our blank canvas, everything to play for. It's like, oh, carte blanche, it's so exciting but so scary. And look, here are three brands that in the very early days, and I'm sure we, we know them all, um, this is what they looked like. We had TransferWise, what was Mondo, and what was the Facebook. And now, like what we should say to lots of people, but no one wants to hear about their baby, it don't always look that pretty, okay? but it will grow out of that awkward phase. And so when we look at this in that very early stage, you've got really good examples of two very different schools of thought. You've got transfer wise, again, doing that Ron Seal test, does what it says on the tin. It's peer-to-peer -peer currency exchange, bang. You as the end user know what you're gonna get from that. The vision and what they were selling as a dream to investors was much bigger, but as the customer, you don't need or want to know that right now. You just want to know what it can do for you in the here and now. You also maybe went the opposite, and it was like, okay, what are we going to name our bank, guys? And you went full on, made up name, because while nobody's going to know what it means to look at, you can build everything that you want around it. You know it might take that little bit more time and investment, but again, it's that carte blanche, it's that blank canvas. So from the early days to that blank canvas and what is the world going to become, we then maybe have a few more tests that get thrown our way. And maybe these include things like having to change your name because you didn't invest in doing the proper IP checks at the beginning and you thought, oh yeah, it'll be fine and uh, nobody will notice. And then it catches up on you. And so there are ways of how you can approach something like this. And if you are a brand that has a value around customer centricity, then you can think about how you can take a negative or a potentially negative such as an IP-like conflict, and turn it into something positive, and that's a great reflection of your brand. So what was Mondo, that we all now know of as Monzo, they decided to use their customers as part of that name change. Now, you could argue that it wasn't exactly the most innovative name change in the world, from a D to a Z, but it doesn't matter. People loved it because they were involved in the journey, and it made you feel positively about them. And when they say we're all about our customers, well, you look at things they were doing from the earliest days, and you can't contradict it. And then, as well, you often are, you know, able to acknowledge that you're limited by what it is you can do in the here and now. And in 2005, Zuckerberg said, like, I think Facebook is an online directory for colleges. There doesn't have to be more. And at that point, there didn't have to be more. There was a huge market and brand opportunity and land grab to be had. To go in at that early stage and start saying we're going to be doing this, that and the other, people wouldn't understand. Whereas to build a brand and a feeling that so resonated, have such a clear idea about who your ideal customer was and it being the university student and having it grow like that made a lot of sense. And you could also, in those testing phases, do things like this. Now, Maybe you are in a macro climate when you're thinking about your positioning that enables you to do something very bold. 
So at the time when TransferWise was launching, the banks were like public enemy number one. It was quite easy to want to hate on the banks. We were coming off the back of the financial crisis, going into another one, so let's see uh, what stuff we see coming out of this. But like, it made it, the, the setting and the context, because context is everything, was quite right to have a brand with a tone and a boldness that was going to push and test the limits of what's around and go to extremes of saying, we have nothing to hide. And at that early stage, you can do things like that. You're still relatively small, you're a disruptor, and you can be disruptive, but only if it's true to the message of the brand and what it is you're putting out there, as well as the context of what's happening in the macro environment and what it is that people want from you and want to hear from you. Then the awkward teenage phase, we maybe get a little bit big for our boots and like, yeah, we're going to move fast and we're going to break things. And yeah, we're really cool like teenagers and this is what we're doing now. And you can be with us or against us and maybe some people will love it, but maybe others won't. Or maybe you get a little bit sweary and you, know, you push that boldness. You're not quite taking your clothes off anymore because after you're a baby or a toddler, you probably aren't allowed to do that in public so much. But you still are like pushing because it's integral to your DNA and what your brand is about. You are pushing the limits of what others around you are doing because that is who you are. And it's like, fuck, that moment when? Because you felt it and you know you're speaking. You're not selling what it is the product does. You know that feeling because we all have feelings. And it's back to that example with the Coke and the Pepsi. You feel emotions and 80% of our decisions, whether we like it or not, are emotionally driven. Apologies to anybody here who thinks they are very deeply rational. But we're all emotional people. And so being able to communicate and have your brand talk to people in a way that actually really speaks to the emotional thing they're feeling has way more possibility and power to convert than you might think. But there comes a phase where we all have to start growing up. We have to step out on our own a little bit more. And we need to think a little bit more seriously about our brand, about what we're putting out in the world, and the stories that we're telling at this point, right? Your product is evolving. The business is evolving. So you still, for example, can say we're beating the banks and we're going after the banks. But again, we're really tapping into what our customer wants and feels about themselves. And so if you're somebody using an innovative new tech company or who's open to using, especially in heavily regulated markets like fintech, if you're open to using new services and financial services, there's got to be something about you that makes you like new things. And, and they cotton on to that. And so on their website, they're telling you this is the clever new way to beat bank fees. And by reading this or engaging in this, it's like, oh yeah, I'm clever, therefore, and I, or I'm winning or I'm beating them, and I'm doing something new. I've got all that bragging rights of, of what I'm doing, and, and they've really understood me and how I think about myself. And so they set that up first, and then they give you all the additional proof points around, here's the money you save, and here's how you can see it brought to life, and here are all these other trust points of why you should back us, because others do. But they're not starting with the very, like, here is the way we are doing this. It's not just that every single brand can say they're doing something bigger, better, faster, but what's the emotional benefit that that's giving you? And also, when you start to grow up a little bit, you need to think about how your brand, even though you might have very iconic colors, like there isn't really a brand I think that has owned a color in the last five years as strongly as Monzo has owned this like hot coral. Like if ever I have my nails that color, people are like, oh, you've got Monzo nails. I'm like, okay, that is some like serious brand penetration there. But even the visual design will become limiting at some stage. And so you need to refresh and think about, well, why is it limiting us? What is it we're wanting to do or push into? Or what is it we're wanting our brand to convey here and now that we need to change it up a little bit to bring that to life? And then when we become a grown-up, responsibility and things really do become real. And especially if you become a public company, you probably can't take your clothes off in public anymore or be swearing on ads. And also you might realize at this point that the brand name that had got you so far and had done so well at passing that Ron Seal test we talked about 
is actually now a limiting factor. And you want to be seen as much more than just transferring money. You do so much more of that. And so you need to solve the brand name so that people realize that the proposition has moved along with you. So maybe you do a rebrand, a very subtle rebrand, but a rebrand. And you make the messaging a lot simpler and cleaner and more grown up. Because again, if you're going to go after a really big land grab, you need people to trust you. And then if you don't be intentional and think about the way you stay true to the brand, what you've said you're going to do, and the way you've positioned yourself, it can all go downhill and you can suffer a bit of a midlife crisis, as we're maybe seeing a little bit here right now. And again, it's a, another rebrand. We all have, I saw some like faces, some little smirks as I put this slide up. But the thing here is that this isn't necessarily a bad rebrand. It's a missed positioning for what the market understands and wants now and what they've made the entire brand promise about. And I think a lot of the pushback is coming from that. There is a journey, back to the early point we said, about how you take people with you and balance the where it is you want to get to and what it is you do now. And if you go too far down into something that's 10 years away, that most people can't engage with or really comprehend right now, you're going to lose people. So to sum up, Oh, my slide went away. To sum up, really your brand is absolutely everything. Please do be intentional about it. But don't sweat the small stuff. Like, it does not need to be that complicated in the beginning stages. Hold yourselves as your like, teams accountable. Like, check in with yourselves. Ask yourselves those questions and see, like, how aligned are we when we answer these questions? Are we saying the same thing? Because if we're not saying the same thing, how can customers possibly or investors possibly understand what it is we're doing? And know that your brand does not stay static. Keep it evolving over time. But keep checking back to make sure it's still aligning with who you are. Thank you very much. <laughs>